that grand staircase and the reception room it leads to might belong to the palace of some great metropolis, except that its windows look out over tall cliffs across the Firth of Clyde. But on a clear day, you can see Marlow Kintyre opposite, mountains of Arran, and in the far distance, the hills around Loch Fyne. This is an 18th century masterpiece by Robert Adam, perhaps the greatest of Scottish architects, built in incomparable surroundings. How did it happen? Once upon a time, this was the ancient Celtic earldom of Carrick, which extended down the coast of Ayrshire, past here. The father of the great king, Robert Bruce, married the Countess of Carrick in her own right, and so he was born in her castle of Turnbury, which is only a few miles south of here, and he was heir to Carrick long before he won the Scottish crown. And in this way, he became connected with the Kennedy family, who were associated with Carrick long before the first Bruce set foot here. So long, in fact, that nobody knows for certain whether they were originally Gales or Pitts. Their castle was originally a few miles north of here at Dunur, but it's only a ruin now because in the 14th century they moved inland to castles up uh, the valley of the Doon, and there built a castle which they enlarged over the centuries, and it remains today the seat of the chief of the Kennedy clan, Marcus of Ailsa, who is the 18th Earl of Castles. There were various junior branches of the Kennedy family living around in this district, and one of these built their castle at Culain. And Sir Thomas Kennedy of Culain was living here when the senior line of castles died out in the 18th century, and he suddenly found himself 9th Earl of Castles. And now a number of very odd things happened. In the first place, the ninth Earl never married, so that when he died, he was succeeded by his brother. And the tenth Earl never married either, so that when he died, the title and the entire estate passed to a distant kinsman who was living in America, the other side of the Atlantic. And another odd thing is that neither of the bachelor brothers chose to leave here and go and live in the seat of the chiefs in the castle of Castles. They preferred to transform this castle and the entire surrounding estate. And this despite the fact that neither of them left any direct descendants to inherit. The ninth Earl, Sir Thomas Kennedy, only built a new block in front of his old castle on the cliff top. He lived in the age of agricultural improvement and his principal concern seems to have been land use. He introduced land drainage schemes, built forestry, uh, introduced more scientific methods of animal husbandry, and in fact it was he who created the landscape as we see it today. Yeah. His brother, the tenth Earl, was the one who invited Robert Adam, the architect, Colain, who made that sketch of the castle before he transformed it. Adam swept away the new building that the ninth Earl had erected. He had something much more impressive in mind to put in its place. But he preserved the proportions of the old castle, in which he designed exquisite new interiors. This room shows you the size of the old tower house. You see, the bachelor earls, like the Adam brothers, had gone on the grand tour of Europe and had come back with the same enthusiasm for classical architecture and the arts of Italy. Robert Adam brought an Italian artist here, and he made these little round paintings in the ceilings that Adam surrounded with his own decorations. This room actually it was originally intended for eating in and so Adam put uh, freezers around the wall showing vine leaves and grapes and you can see the same pattern about the doors and about the fireplace. Adam in fact designed just about everything. The mirror over the chimney was made to his specification. So were the pendants on the end walls for carrying candles and you can see that he's used the design of the swan. The swan was the supporter, the supporters on either side, of the Kennedy coat of arms. Even the tables here were made to Adam's design, though the gilt ones under the candle brackets are modern copies. It's the same in the drawing room on the floor above. Actually, the mirror above the fireplace was made in 1977, but the design is Adam's, and it's a marvellous example of the work of restoration and and repair work and replacement that's going on all the time here. Notice that it contains the Kennedy swans, only in this case, 
they've got a, an earl's coronet between them. And surrounding the mirror is silk damask that was actually woven about the same time that the mirror was made, another example of the restoration work. But either side of the mirror are original candle brackets of Adam's design. And at the end of the room, there's a china cabinet designed by him, containing porcelain views of Paris. Looking down on this elegant scene is the portrait of the ninth Earl. And on another wall, there are portraits of two wives of earlier Earls, only these ones didn't live in Cologne. Uh, they lived in the castle of Castles, though I don't suppose they mind being moved here. In fact, one of them probably wished she'd never lived in Castles, because this is Jean Hamilton, the Earl of Haddington's daughter, who, after she'd become Countess of Castles, according to the legend, tried to elope with Johnny Farr, the Gypsy King pair were caught and brought back to castles and there she was forced to watch from a window while he was hanged from a tree outside and afterwards according to the tale she was confined in Maybow. I can't help wondering whether the little painting in the roof of this room has any reference to this sad story. On the face of it it's a perfectly ordinary classical subject but why did the Italian artist choose the theme of the little god of love Cupid being disarmed? The room next door to this one is immediately above the old dining room that we were in earlier. And so it preserves the exact proportions of the original tower house. And being on this floor, it corresponds to the great halls of those buildings, such as we see at Craig Yvar and Crathis. But what a difference. Instead of the great vaulted ceiling and a huge open fireplace, we have the usual Adam classical interior, with one of his mirrors above at the fireplace and with his candle pendants on either side. And looking down on this room is the 10th Earl who commissioned all these things. And on another wall there is Captain Kennedy and his wife Anne Watts, the New York heiress, who found themselves the heirs to this wonderful castle and its surrounding property. Incidentally, they were the parents of the man who became uh, the first Marquis of Ailsa. He was created Marquis by his friend King William IV. And on a nearby wall, there's a painting by Alexander Naismith of the castle showing Ailsa Craig in the Firth of Clyde from which he took his title. I suppose Naismith is best remembered today for his portraits of Robert Burns, but actually his greatest talent lay in landscape painting. And this room contains two uh, wonderful examples of his art. This grand staircase and the great round reception room it leads to are really the crowning glories of Robert Adams' work in Calais. And like the other rooms, both of these is a great deal of painstaking restoration. For instance, these banister supports, they'd all been covered over with gilt paint, and every single one of them had to be taken out and stripped down so that we can once again see the original metals they were made of. For the great round room, a new carpet was woven in nearby Irvine, exactly resembling the original of Adams. And his original carpet was also said to have been made locally in Maybow. The colours of the ceiling had been lost, the original ones, but there's a watercolour sketch that Adam made that survived, and it was used to restore the original colours of the ceiling. generosity and dedication of all sorts of people that made this possible is a wonderful story. When Colleen was offered to the National Trust for Scotland in 1945 by the fifth Marquis of Ailsa, he couldn't afford to provide an endowment. 
trust itself had only been in, in existence for 14 years and had very scanty resources. And in addition, the country was impoverished by the Second World War and government help could hardly be expected. It really was a very brave and risky undertaking that the trustees shouldered when they accepted Ghislaine Castle and 560 acres of surrounding land in November 1945. The most extraordinary stipulation in the agreement between the Kennedy family and the Trust was this. The top floor of the castle was to be offered to General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe, as a home for life, a gesture of gratitude from the Scottish nation. His flat was ready for him in time for him to pay his first visit in the autumn of 1946, with his wife, his mother-in-law and his son. General Eisenhower lived for another 23 years after that, and in the course of this time, he became President of the United States of America, and his association with Kalein will never be forgotten. Here we can see the very desk at which he planned the North Africa landing. Many mementos have been donated, as well as an exhibition that tells the story of his life. As for the flat, that he used throughout his life. It's been agreed between the National Trust for Scotland and Scottish Heritage of the United States that it's to be rented to people for private visits or for conferences they want to hold here. The sitting room of this flat occupies the floor immediately above the great round saloon has the same proportions and the same magnificent view over the Firth of Clyde. Notice that there's no access to this top floor by the central stairway. Robert Adam had provided a separate stairway to the top floor at the side. And of course today there's a lift as well so that visitors here can come and go in complete privacy. The labour and expense of restoring the inside of the castle to its original magnificence has been matched by the task of rescuing the outer fabric from the ravages of time and the weather. Its sandstone had been seriously damaged by the salt winds and it was discovered that the nearest stone of the same sort and of sufficient quality had to be brought all the way from Northumbria. The task of putting a new skin on the outer fabric still continues, paid for by a fund that's been specially set up and by various money-raising activities. Then there are the gardens, which owe so much to the third Marquis of Ailsa. He really was the most remarkable man. He inherited the title when he was only 22 years old, and he didn't die until he was over 90 in 1938, so that he was in charge of this estate for about 70 years. People can still see the wedding present that he gave to his wife on display in the castle. The third Marquis had a particular enthusiasm for boats, and in fact, he played a major part in developing boat building on the Clyde. 
and on display in the castle are models of his yachts and paintings of them. And there's also the model of HMS Britannia, which he made himself. And you can see how he altered the figurehead to the effigy of a Highlander. One of the most bizarre mementos of the third Marquis is the cradle that the Ailes Shipbuilding Company made for his children. A curious tribute to the man who founded modern yacht building on the Clyde. But something very different has been founded here on the banks of the Clyde more recently, something in which far more young children can share in these times. In 1967, the Countryside Scotland Act was placed on the statute book with strong support from the Trust. And two years later, Killane was designated Scotland's first country park. And so well has it been developed since then that it's been described recently as the most remarkable country park in Britain. Well, I haven't seen all the others, but I can well believe it. Well, you're now 40 feet up in the woodland, rather than being right down on the woodland floor where we started out. What are the main differences that you've noticed? The changes that have taken place from down there to up here? It's darker down there. It's darker down there, yes. Anything else? Warmer down there. Warmer down there. Why do you think that There's is? It's more light up here, that's true. Why do you think it's, it's warmer down there? The old home farm was altered to become the country park centre, now called the visitor's centre. This beautiful complex reveals that Robert Adam could do something more than build romantic castles and decorate exquisite drawing rooms. He could also design the perfect functional buildings in which barns and stables, a dairy, pens for pigs, sheds for agricultural machinery and for keeping carts, and the lodgings of farm workers could all be collected together in a single unit surrounding a sheltered court with open arches all round. Combining elegance with utility, it's possibly the finest thing of its kind. But like the fabric of the castle, the home farm had become very dilapidated. And the task of repairing it and adapting it to modern uses was a formidable one. The fundraising, the devoted support of individuals and public bodies, the dedication and skill which went into making this visitor center what it is today is a saga in itself. Amongst the arresting features of the teamwork is that it was that of a consortium in which Ayrshire County Council and the town councils of Kilmarnock and Ayr joined forces with the Trust. Their object was to provide facilities for no less than 300,000 people, whereas when Killane was first opened to the public in 1947, there were less than 6,000 visitors. The visitor centre was opened in 1973, and it contains the offices of the principal of the country park, Gordon Riddle. Gordon, how did you manage to adapt buildings that were designed for such a very different purpose for, to meet your own? Well, the first thing the architect had to do was really to take the buildings back to Robert Adams' original design and then adapt for visitor services. And this was uh, quite difficult. There was obviously the odd compromise with a couple of sections being added on. Obviously, Robert Adams didn't have an auditorium, so that had to be added yeah, on to yeah. one section. And the kitchen was expanded. But otherwise, the original structure was kept. But then it was a case of adapting to the different needs of people coming in. So some sections of the building were adapted to different things, like the, the barn and stable became the restaurant. And in this case, uh, all that had to be done really was that the original arches had to be glazed over. Other buildings, like the cattle sheds, became the toilets and the, the shop. Uh, the pigsty became the office block. The dairy has been converted into a young naturalist club room, the nature discovery room. And it's, it's an, a base for our thriving Young Naturalist Club, which has about 400 members. And it has projects in it which stimulate activities in the park, so the children then go out and uh, enjoy themselves and become involved. The upstairs is converted into an exhibition, telling, really highlighting the main period of change in Killeen's history, and that was between 1760 and about 1830, when from a, an area of blasted heathland, the 9th and 10th Earls really converted the area into the estate you have today. So the, the Tractorman's house now houses the, the first part of the exhibition. And then we move into the loft, which tells us the main story of how 
the area changed dramatically. One of the outside bodies that's helped in the transformation of Killeen is the Manpower Service Commission. A team of its enthusiasts has cleaned and repaired all the weapons that were handed to the West Lowland Fencible Regiment by the 12th Earl of Castles to meet the threat of an invasion by Napoleon. These weapons are one of the first sights that visitors of the castle see because they've been arranged on the walls of the original entrance that was designed by Robert Adam, and a fine sight they are. On one wall you can see 120 bayonets arranged in the form of a star. These weapons, the flintlock pistols and hanger swords, were fairly old-fashioned when they were handed out to the West Lowland Fencibles, who of course weren't a frontline regiment. And I like to see them as symbols of the work of hundreds of people, many of them anonymous, most of them young, who gave such great help in the recovery of Killeen as a national treasure. I've been tempted to mention the individuals, but for whom this might never have happened most of whom are extremely well known. But there were so many of them, and at their backs there were so many more giving their support. And I prefer to think of this as an achievement of collective enthusiasm and national pride. When people of all ages and all walks of life came together after the war when we were trying to rebuild the future out of the heritage of our past and made Killeen a model of this endeavor. Another outside body that helps the Trust in its work is the Countryside Commission for Scotland, which gives a grant for the maintenance of the Ranger Service, which operates under the direction of Principal Gordon Riddle. Uh, this body began work in 1970 and has a full-time staff of four and more during the height of the season. And its members act as guides for the visitors, they arrange outside teaching for schools in association with the schools of Strathclyde, and they also act as wardens of the park, which includes a great walled garden. In this garden, there's a summer house, a Victorian summer house, and here they've arranged a forestry exhibition. On the boundaries of the park, there's what remains of the old railway line, which used to run from Deneur in the north down through here to Turnbury in the south. And then there's the pond, which swans share with Muscovy duck and with the seabirds that fly in to rob the pond of fish got a lot of fish in it. And by the side of the pond, there's a delicious little complex of buildings in which they put an aviary and also a tea house where people can rest on their way to the shore. I think those two bachelor earls must have had a very strong affection for the sea when they re refused to move from here to the castle of Castles like the third Marquis with his love of boats. Port Carrick lies at the southern end of the park, and there's an entire marine world between there and the cliffs beneath the castle.
people of all ages are drawn to this lovely shoreline. First of all, anything we find, we're going to be putting in water and then returning to the rock pool. We're going to leave this rock pool really as we found it. Okay. Where do you think most of the animals are going to be living in the rock pool? Whereabouts? Yes, under the rocks. Certainly under the rocks. You're going to be turning over rocks then to find the animals. What must you remember to do once you leave? Yes. Yes, that's right. In fact, turn the rocks back the way you've actually found them. Before we start as well, I want you to make sure you've got water in your buckets. Nothing be, must be put in an empty bucket. What sort of animals do you think we're likely to find? Yes, mussels. Well done. What else? Shrimps. Shrimps, right. Yes. Crabs. Well done. We'll put some water in your buckets then before we start. We shouldn't forget when we're in these surroundings, the boy of 16 who came here 200 years ago. Robert Burns was sent to stay with his uncle, Samuel Brown, who was a tenant farmer, his mother's brother, while he was studying maths in Kirk Oswald. Now, when he was here, this coast was a nest for smugglers. And Burns recalled that this was where he first saw scenes of drunkenness and dissipation. No doubt the smugglers enjoying their profits. In the graveyard of Kirk Oswald is Tam's grave. Nearby is Shanta's farm. And all these memories came back to him later and inspired that masterpiece of comic narration about a man who's drunk too much, Tam Shanta. No doubt the young people who come to the shore today carry away rather different memories. Let's see it. This orange. I don't know, I think it's babies. It's not standing still. Any idea why it's living in a winkle shell? Protection. That's right, it doesn't in fact have a shell of its own. So it has to actually live in somebody else's shell. Look, here's another one. It's living in a tower shell. And they actually keep moving home. Can you find the dream the of all tower? those who wondered so often in the earlier years whether Colleen was going to make or break the trust has been realised. Forty years on since the trustees took that brave step. Far more visitors come to visit Culain than any other property administered by the National Trust for Scotland. It's one of the great assets of our national heritage. This is a magnet that attracts people from all over the world to the banks of Loch Fyne. The castle of the Dukes of Argyle, chiefs of Clan Campbell, is the pioneer of Gothic revival architecture in Scotland. More remarkable still, the little borough along the shore beyond its drive is by far the earliest example of systematic town planning in the whole country. Remember that these two achievements were conceived in the heart of the West Highlands at a time when this spot wasn't even connected by road to any of the main crucibles of new ideas or places where large-scale public works were being carried out. What magic wand created two such different things as a Gothic castle and a town of classical design at one and the same time here of all places?
The Kublai Khan who decreed these things was a Campbell chief who would never have succeeded as third duke if any of the five daughters of his elder brother had turned out to be a son. And naturally, he was fairly old by the time his brother died, he was 60 in fact. In 1743, when this occurred, he hadn't visited Inverera for upwards of 30 years. He'd been born in palatial Ham House outside London, and he'd spent his life looking after Scottish political affairs so effectively that he became known as King of Scotland. What attracted him to Inverera in his old age? Its castle was so ruinous that it was in danger of falling down. The village on its doorstep was described as squalid and poverty-stricken. His grandfather had been executed for treason, and his father had fled abroad to escape the same fate. And although he'd returned at the revolution of 1688 and be made a duke by William of Orange, there was that interval during which the Campbell chiefs were absent from their home, their power in eclipse. And even when they recovered it, they made their headquarters far from here. What moved the third duke to reverse this trend is something of a mystery. But he did it as soon as the ducal coronet had landed on his head, although he took months to prepare his journey here and weeks before he arrived at Inverera. Two years later, some drawings were made which show us what he found. And within about 15 years, the new castle was taking shape between the ruins of the old one and the old village. And another mystery is this. The third duke erected this monument in the last years of his life, although he had no direct heir to leave it to. And it was bound to pass, at his death, to an elderly cousin. And two years before his death, an imaginary painting was made showing what he had in mind, the new castle in surroundings cleared of the medieval tower house and the old village, though he didn't live to see those surroundings cleared. He didn't even live to inhabit his new home, although he survived until he was nearly 80 years old. He did, however, see the first houses occupied in the new town along the shore beside Loch Fyne. He'd only been back in Inverera a few months before he inaugurated this development, and a lot of this magnificent layout was already erected before his death. For instance, the new townhouse was finished by 1757 with a jail on the ground floor, a court house on the floor above, and a school on the top floor. The inn had been completed before then, although it's been enlarged since, and these buildings were erected while his castle was still rising from its foundations. This is very much more the kind of style you'd expect from the chief architect involved. His name was Roger Morris, and he'd already built a Palladian mansion called Marble Hill House, which you can still see at Twickenham, for the third duke before he came up here. And Roger Morris was assisted by William Adam, the father of the distinguished Adam brothers, and he'd already built the classical house of Haddo for the Earl of Aberdeen. And yet it was Roger Morris who designed that Gothic castle, and William Adam who drew the foundation plan. And now we come to another marvel in this story, Stranger Than Fiction. William Adam died in 1748, and Roger Morris followed him to the grave only a few years later, when almost nothing had been done to implement their original designs. And yet they were carried out without either of their authors to supervise. And it was the sons of Roger Morris and William Adam who implemented their father's work. But of course, the presiding genius was that elderly, brilliant, very eccentric man, the third duke. What sort of person was he? A great collector of books who assembled the finest private library in the entire country and brought it to Inverera. He was also a great collector of men of talent, 
irrespective of their social status. How else could he have assembled the loyalty and the skill to carry out this great building venture here, which was unparalleled at the time anywhere in Scotland or in England either? He'd been left a widow 20 years before he became Duke, without having any heir, and he lived since then with a mistress who grew old with him and for whom he provided his death. And they had a son, and there was a great deal of affection between them, and yet he never married the mother or attempted to legitimize the son as his heir. It's all very odd. But what shines out of this story is the range of interests of the third duke and his capacity to assemble the skilled team which gave this embodiment to an old man's dream. The duke saw the completion of the bridge over Garran Water. It was Roger Morris who designed it. The Duke and William Adam approved the drawing, and Adam's son John had completed it by 1747, shortly before the death of the two architects. It was an integral part of the network of military roads and bridges that Field Marshal Wade had been supervising in the Highlands before the 1745 uprising. This work continued after the defeat of the Jacobites, and the bridge completed the military road that established a land connection between Inverera and Dumbarton. John Adam went on to design and build a more Gothic-looking bridge over the Aero River beyond, which was begun ten years later. This was swept away by a spate in 1772, and you may think the one that replaced it was an improvement. Behind it you can see the hill called Dunicuaig, with its tower. The third duke went up there to look down on the property he planned to transform on his very first visit in 1744. And here, three years later, he and Roger Morris and William Adam decided to crown it with an imitation antique watchtower overlooking the castle and the Aero River. Then the inevitable happened, 17 years after the third duke had entered into this inheritance. He died and was succeeded by that elderly cousin General John Campbell. He was a kindly man, a genuinely professional soldier, whose interest was the army not building projects at Inverera. During the ten years when he was the fourth duke, these more or less ground to a halt. But at last there was an heir who succeeded when he was relatively young, and he was also a direct heir, the late duke's son. The fifth duke was still in his forties when Inverera became his, and it also now had a mistress, a most remarkable woman. She was the famous beauty Elizabeth Gunning, and was the widow Duchess of Hamilton before she became Duchess of Argyle. And it's a truly exceptional tribute to her character that despite her looks and her enviable good fortune, nobody could ever think of an ill word to say about her. An ideal couple had arrived to complete the work of the third duke. They brought to Inverera another Scottish architect, one whose international reputation rivaled that of the Adam brothers themselves, Robert Mill. He left the external appearance of the castle intact. On the other hand, he redesigned the windows on the main floor so that they presented the pointed Gothic arches on the outside and rounded classical ones in the great public rooms. These he decorated most beautifully. Everyone who visits the castle will notice what a splendid collection of portraits they contain. The third duke had been painted by Alan Ramsay, 
The fifth was painted by Gainsborough. This duke attended to the ornamentation of the castle grounds as promptly as he commissioned Robert Milne to improve its interior. The medieval castle ruin was demolished at last, and the surrounding policies laid out and planted with trees. However, he was no mere dilettante any more than the third duke had been, providing himself with a stately pleasure dome. He was a professional soldier like his father and rose to the rank of field marshal. He experimented with mechanical contrivances in his workshop. Where the third duke had tried to introduce linen and woolen manufacture in his new borough, the fifth duke became the first president of the Highland and Agricultural Society and did all he could to promote improvements in land use. When the British Fisheries Society was set up in 1786, he became the first governor. And this led him to build the port of Tobermory on the Isle of Mount. Robert Milne was only commissioned to decorate the inside of the castle. In 1776, he prepared this design for the new home farm buildings. The remains of them that we see today give us little idea of their original significance. When they were built, they were the only ones of their kind in Scotland. Their courtyard was levelled, drained and gravelled. Round it were a smith's forge, the riding house, and barns capable of drying huge quantities of grain by means of a special principle of ventilation. What survives of the original structure stands as a tribute to Milne's versatility and his patron's concern for improved methods of husbandry. The estate offices at Cherry Park near the castle were built at about the same time. In Glenshira, Milne designed a circular complex of farm buildings, but in this case they were only half completed. The second design is dated 1796, and by this time the Duke was faced by an appalling drain on his resources. His son and heir, the Marquis of Lorne, had fallen into the company of the Rakes of London, and in that year the equivalent of millions of pounds in today's money had to be found to pay his debts. The London hostess Lady Holland described the Marquis of Lorne as very handsome and well-formed, but she observed that although he enjoyed every advantage a man could wish for, it does not appear that he enjoys anything, like so many people whose only object is their own selfish pleasure. By the time he succeeded as the sixth duke, his debts were estimated at about double what all his talented and conscientious predecessors had spent on the buildings of Inverera. This man remained the owner of the estate for over 30 years. But although the sixth duke married in the end, he left no legitimate son, only a lot of illegitimate ones. And fortunately, he had a most worthy brother waiting to succeed him. In fact, his brother, Lord John Campbell, stepped in whenever he could to do what his elder brother ought to have been doing while he was still alive. When a typhus epidemic broke out in 1818, he set up a fever hospital on the estate to look after its victims. At about the same time, plans were being considered for a new courthouse because the old one was considered inadequate, and especially the cells for prisoners on its ground floor. It was Lord John who acted as chairman of the commission, although the Duke was supposed to be responsible, and by 1820, James Gillespie's handsome new building had been completed. The new prison was erected behind it on the seashore. Later, Lord John joined the Fisheries Board and the town authorities in paying for the new extension to the pier. Quite apart from the herring fishing, steamboats were now bringing visitors in increasing numbers to admire this beautiful little borough and its entrancing surroundings. They didn't admire the castle so much, which was empty a lot of the time, and soon began to show signs of neglect. Lord John's sister Charlotte was married to another John Campbell, the heir to Isla, a man as estimable as himself. Unhappily, he died young, but his widow lived to acquire considerable fame as a novelist, while their son, Walter Campbell, had already started building the model port in Isla in 1828, which he named Port Charlotte in his mother's memory. The Campbells of Isla had emulated the Dukes of Argyle earlier than this when they built the planned village of Beaumore with its round church. And it's interesting that a round church was part of William Adams' original plan for the borough of Inverera. 
Here it was intended to be divided in half to provide for separate English and Gallic congregations. But the third duke died before it was built, and the design seems to have been mislaid. And in due course, both congregations attended public worship in the two houses that now comprise the George Hotel. It was left to the fifth duke to carry out the original plan, building a church for both Gallic and English speakers at the focal point of the borough. This was Robert Milne's last commission. The spire survived until 1941, when it was removed because it was considered unsafe. But it was already being described as in want of repairs in the time of the spendthrift duke, with broken panes and windows boarded up. Then, in 1839, he paid a visit to Inverera after several years' absence and died suddenly, the best thing he ever did for the place. And his brother, Lord John, had eight years in which to continue the painful task of saving his inheritance from ruin. Everyone who comes to admire Milne's magnificently decorated dining room in the castle can see what could so easily have been lost. So Inverera survived into the Victorian era when the eighth duke succeeded his father at the age of 24, already married to the fabulously wealthy Duke of Sutherland's daughter, which must have helped the family finances considerably. And in 1847, the very year they became Duke and Duchess, the young queen sailed up Loch Fyne to visit them in her yacht with Prince Albert and their little children. One of these was Princess Louise, who married the Duke's eldest son when they grew up. And here she still looks down on a room that reflects the Victorian domesticity which the Argyle family exemplified as respectably as the queen herself. In the very year after the Queen's first visit, the Duke laid out new gardens round the castle, replacing the dense shrubbery with formal flower beds that expressed the same sense of propriety and good order in which his family lived their lives. Today, the grounds of the castle can be enjoyed by rather more people in activities that are part of the fabric of Highland life. Yes, it's just a week before the 
the 8th Duke and his wife were personal friends of Queen Victoria, and he died in 1900, only a short while before his sovereign. During his long lifetime, he served as a cabinet minister under Gladstone in successive liberal administrations for upwards of 30 years. He was a man of versatile interests who wrote and spoke about a great number of things. But one of his most impressive interests, in my opinion, was his enthusiasm for Gallic folklore studies. At a time when so many Highland chiefs were becoming increasingly anglicised, he gave all the support he could to John Francis Campbell of Isla, the father of these Gallic studies. Young John of Isla, as he was called, Ian Org Isla, had begun his collecting before the young duke inherited his title, a rather different activity from his uh, grandmother's, Lady Charlotte Campbell, the novelist, who was still alive and well at this time. With the Duke's help, he was able to enlist the support of all kinds of people on the Argyle estates. Hector Urquhart, for instance, a gamekeeper at Ardkin Glass. And most particularly, John Dewar, who had begun sending tales to John of Isla in 1859 from Glenda Rule, and continued until his death in 1872, building up a collection of seven manuscript volumes in his beautiful handwriting. This tale uh, tells the story of the hero of the Montrose Wars, known in English as Colquita, Mac Colachiathach. John Dewar and Hector Urquhart lived to see the publication of John of Isla's four volumes of the popular tales of the West Highlands, uh, to which both of them contributed and they're named uh, among the givers of the story. In the year of John Dewar's death, John of Isla published the first collection of Oceanic ballads uh, that was ever seen in print in this country, calling it Lyorn Athena, the Book of the Singalians. One of these ballads tells the story of the death of Jim, who is the mythical ancestor of the Campbells. They're known in Gaelic as the children of Jim, uh, Clown Yeremich. This ballad tells how Jermot killed the wild boar and a bristle entered his Achilles heel, which was the only vulnerable part of him, and he bled to death. Among those who've recorded this ballad is that great Gaelic singer James Campbell, who made this recording before his death in 1979. <laughs> Others continued the work that John of Isla and his colleagues had begun. Notably, the minister of the Isle of Tyree, John Gregerson Campbell. And this castle preserves his manuscripts as well, uh, which were turned into a number of volumes on uh, various Gaelic folklore subjects. The Eighth Duke was particularly concerned that his family should be properly educated in Highland traditions and Highland history. And it must have given him a greater satisfaction when his younger son, Lord Archibald Campbell, studied the records of Argyll and published a volume on them. The precious library of the third duke had had to be sold to help pay the debts of the degenerate sixth duke. But today, this library at Inverera Castle contains the most precious collection of Gaelic manuscripts in the home of any Highland chief. In 1877, when the castle looked like this, a fire destroyed all the central portion of it. And when the building had been restored, the corner turrets were given conical roofs, and the top floor was heightened. So the central tower no longer dominated the building in the same way. And this is what the castle still looked like when another fire broke out about a century later, uh, starting with a conflagration in the linen room on the top floor until the entire roof burst into flames. 
A lot of very precious pictures were lost. But the plasterwork in the stateroom by Robert Milne uh, was saved, and so was the library with its priceless manuscript collection. So were the relics of Rob Roy McGregor, commemorating one of the most remarkable Highlanders who ever lived, and also a very touching tale of mutual trust and loyalty. You may be surprised that this involves a Campbell and a McGregor after the centuries of enmity between the two, uh, between the two clans. But two of Rob Roy's grandparents out of four were Campbells, and when his own name was prescribed, he adopted the name of Campbell himself. Here there's a letter that Rob Roy wrote to the Duke of Argyle during the 1715 uprising. Of course, the Duke was Hanoverian, and Rob Roy was a Jacobite. But a lot of people were keeping their options open when the issue was still in doubt. Afterwards, each man was tempted to betray the other. Rob Roy refused every bribe to betray the Duke, and the Duke, for his part, gave Rob Roy asylum on more than one occasion when he was in desperate need. And it's appropriate that the relics of this hero of novels and plays and opera should be preserved here, not the least bizarre of the treasures in the home of the Campbell chief. Thank you.